So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gorka Yazuki, and I'm doing a PhD in Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. And the, the topic of my research project is side channel attacks in the cloud, and that's what I'm going to try to explain today. <coughs> so this is the outline that we're going to follow. First of all, we're going to talk about the motivation for us to, to spend money in such a project. Then we're going to give a, a brief overview uh, uh, so of the background that we need to, to understand the attacks we did in the cloud. And then we're going to actually explain the attacks we did, the two attacks that we did, Bernstein and Flash and Reload. Then we're going to discuss some possible countermeasures and then um, give some conclusions. So let's start. Um, the motivation for us is pretty clear. We have a widely used system, which is the cloud system, right? And actually, we can see that in the graph I'm showing to you. We can see, let's see if the mouse works. Here, yes. So we can see that in 2005, the usage of physical machines was much more than the usage of virtual machines. But we also see that we have a tipping point in 2009 in which the usage of both of them were, was almost even. And in 2013, actually, the usage of virtual machine, machines increased a lot so that almost doubles the usage of, virtual, of physical machines. <clears throat> so as researchers, we ask ourselves if um, these virtual machines uh, in, implement some uh, sandboxing, process, sandboxing techniques to, to isolate processes, right? So if one virtual machine can recover information from other virtual machine. And since we're working in side channel attacks, we actually <coughs> are gonna focus in hardware leakage, right? We're interested, well, since, since we know that the cloud um, is based on offering resources for more than one user, if we have two virtual machines using the same hardware, we want to know if um, the usage of, of, of the, the usage of a shared hardware leaks some information to an attacker interested in, in inferring some, some kind of key, for example. So these are the, these are the kind of questions that motivated, that motivated us to, to start a project, the project, but also the previous uh, publications that have been done, right? For example, one of the most important ones is, hey, you get off my cloud. Uh, it was written by uh, Ristenpart and some other co-authors, and what they managed to do is in a public cloud system, um, they collocated the attacker's virtual machine with the victim's virtual machine so that um, they are both using the same, the same shared hardware. This is really important because now that we can collocate victim's virtual machine and attacker's virtual machine, we can actually implement uh, known side channel attacks in the cloud. And that's what actually Sang and some other co-authors did in, the, in their paper Home Alone, in which they are using um, side, channel, well, side channel techniques to detect whether they are using uh, alone the hardware or they are collocated with some other tenant. But also they, they use that side channel technique to attack um, an L gambling, well, to recover an L gambling encryption key across XM virtual machines. With, well, the name of this side channel technique is Prime and Prof. We'll see it later on, so don't worry about that. So yeah, this is kind of the motivation we need to, to start the project, and, and before we implement any attack, we need to have some background, right? And that's, what, that's why we decided to do this outline. And actually, the first thing we have to know is how the cloud works, right? And here, we're gonna give some main characteristics uh, out the cloud systems. Well, the first one, I already mentioned it, right? Um, resources for one of one physical host are provided for more than one client. So this means that users are gonna share hardware, right? So we have many users here, using, for example, the infrastructure server or a storage server. <clears throat> so, but also we have to have some hidden details of infrastructure because since we are sharing the hardware with other people, we, don't, we cannot have a full access to the hardware because that would mean compromising other people's data. So we have to have some hidden details there. Also, these services are always on. This means that if I wanna run a computation that, ten, that takes, for example, 10 hours, um, I'd rather do it in the cloud because in that way, I'm not gonna consume my, my own resources, like my laptop, for example, and I can do something else in my laptop. And then after 10 hours, I can go to the cloud and check if the result has been done. <clears throat> also, of course, like everything in this life, this, uh, this is not free. Of course, you, we have to pay, pay for that. And usually, cloud providers, they have a, like a price, um, depending on the, on the machine we're using. So the more powerful the machine is, the, the more expensive the, the price is gonna be. Also, these, uh, these servers are accessed remotely, so we might be using a hardware that is, for example, in California or Seattle while we're here. So this is amazing. <clears throat> well, examples of, of, of public cloud providers, for example, well, 
Cloud providers can offer many services. One of them is storage, and I guess all of us know Dropbox, right? This is one of the main examples of storage cloud providers. <coughs> but it's not the only one, surprisingly, right? We have more options. We have Google Drive, for example. We have the Spider Oak, and we have, oh, sorry, and we have OneDrive. So all, all these providers uh, offer storage so that we can uh, store data in, in, <coughs> in their servers rather than in our computer. But also, infrastructure services can be, can be offered. This means that um, cloud providers are going to offer powerful machines so that, you, powerful machines so that users are going to rent the, the resources to compute, for example, heavy load, heavy load computations. And examples of this, uh, public cloud, this kind of uh, public cloud providers are Amazon, Rackspace, Google, and Windows, for example. So as we can see, um, big companies are starting to offer this this kind of service because they're, see, they're seeing that um, it's widely used and, and they get benefit out of that. So from now on, in the presentation, we're gonna focus on infrastructure cloud providers. <coughs> and as we said, um, well, shared res well, resources are provided from, for more than one user, right? But we didn't explain how this is achieved, right? Well, it's, it is achieved uh, thanks to a virtualization technique in which, well, which has three main tasks. First of all, it has to provide virtual machines to the client so that the client can feel like he's using his own OS or, or his desired OS in his, own, in his own machine. But also it has to give, again, abstraction of, uh, with the physical machine because, again, more than one user, as we can see in the picture, well, in the picture, we can see three different uh, guests that are using different OSs, right? Um, so since we have more than one user using the same hardware, uh, we have to, again, have some abstraction with the physical machine. If not, we, if we could access the whole memory, we, we would be compromising the, the other tenant state again. And to control that, we have a VM or, VMM or hypervisor, which actually controls the, the, the accesses to hardware of each, of, of each one of the guests, of each one of the virtual machines. And examples of these VMMs, as I say there, are Xen VMware, well, we have more, we have KVM as well, and Hyper-V, which are, for me, the four most known ones. Well, so this is the cloud, and, and what's the main concern here? Sin concern, since we're using the hardware with mo more than one people, so the big concern is uh, if my privacy is being compromised, right? <coughs> so I guess this, the answer to this question depends on the person you're asking to. If you're asking, well, we have an example, well, here example of this two weeks ago we had. For example, if we ask to iCloud or Apple, what are they gonna say? Yeah, my, my cloud doesn't have any any flaw in their security system, but what happens if we ask Jennifer Lawrence or Kirsten Dust? They're pretty sure that, well, <laughs> this is the Twitter that Kirsten Dust um, yeah, wrote. So yeah, or, or all these actresses that have been hacked, well, I guess their, their answer is gonna be pretty different to, to the answer of the cloud providers. And my answer here is gonna be, or the answer that I'm trying to say here is that um, there is some hardware leakage that, can be, that should be avoided because that leakage can be converted into, into valid information for an attacker. And how are we gonna do this? Well, as I say here, we're gonna do it thanks to side channel attacks. And since we wanna use, uh, use them, we have to explain what they are. Well, side channel attacks, um, so basically side channel attacks measure a, a leakage coming from a secure process and, then and they convert this leakage to valid information. And the main idea is the one we see in the, in the picture in which we have a box, um, and we don't know what the box contains, but instead of opening it, which would be the direct channel, let's say, um, we measure its power consumption, for example, and, and figure out what's inside the box. So we're using a covert channel instead of a direct channel. That's why we call them side channel attacks. Well, these leakage can come in many forms. For example, let's assume that we have an embedded device here running RSA, for example, and we can actually measure the, the power consumption of this device, and we're gonna see that for different keys, the power traces are gonna look different. So thanks to these differences, we can infer what key has been used by, by the embedded processor. <clears throat> we can also do the same thing with the electromagnetic leakage. We can measure electromagnetic emanations, and we're gonna see again that different electromagnetic emanations uh, yeah, refer to different keys. But also, we can do the same thing with the execution time of a process. There are some processes that are, well, the execution time of some processes is key dependent. This means that for one key, we're gonna have more cycles, for another key, we're gonna have less, less cycles. And again, these, these differences in hardware cycles, um, we can use them to, to infer the key that has been used. 
So right, we want to use um, side channel attacks. We want to do them in the cloud. But first of all, the first thing we have to, to find is a co good cover channel in the cloud, right? And this depends on the assumption that we're going to make as attackers. Um, first of all, the first assumption is going to be that we are that attacker and victim are co-located in the same physical machine. But we have to be more specific here, because the attacker and victim can be located in the same core, in which case the attacker can use any any resource that is private per core, right? For example, branch predictors, level one cache, as we see in the picture. So we see in the picture that the core one, well, the, sorry, the level one cache is private for each core. So we can use the level one cache, branch predictors, TLBs as well, and so on. <clears throat> but this is kind of a strong assumption, because um, so public cloud providers offer machines that have maybe 20 cores. So being located in the same core is, might be more or less difficult. So what if we want to go farther away? What if we want to be located in, in a different core? Well, in this case, we're, we have to look for something shared across cores, right? Something, some hardware resource that is shared across cores. And luckily for us, uh, most modern processors have um, a last shared level of cache, which we can use to, to detect accesses, right? <clears throat> so this is more or less the scenario that we're going to follow. So we have, we're going to have a victim here uh, making accesses to this shared level of cache while another attacker is going to try to infer what, uh, the, what these accesses were. So nice. We have a suitable cover channel, which is the, the cache, right? But we didn't explain what the cache is. The cache is basically a small memory located between the CPU and the RAM, um, whose goal is to avoid penalties uh, of, well, the penalty of going to a memory and retrieve the data from the, from the memory. So we have, well, this small memory that we're going to insert, well, that hardware designers are going to insert between the memory and the, and the, and the CPUs, first of all, it's going, to it's going to store data that has been accessed recently, because the CPU predicts that these data are going to be accessed soon. Um, but also, it stores data, that, well, data in nearby locations to the data that has been accessed. Again, because the CPU predicts that are going to be accessed soon again. So this is the way it looks like. We have two cores. Here, uh, we have private level one cache for each one. Well, the level one cache is divided into data and instruction cache. And then we have a shared cache, a shared level two cache, and the main memory, right? So clearly, um, accesses to these small memories uh, are going to be faster than accesses to this shared unified cache. And accesses to this shared unified cache are going to be faster than accesses to the main memory. So this, this difference is in, in access times is, the, is what we're going to use to infer the key that has been used by a secure process. So since we're going to use cache side channel attacks, we need to know what's out there in, ter in terms of cache side channel attacks. And we find out, the first thing we find out is that they can be divided into three main categories. The first one is access-driven attacks. The, ex the second one is trace-driven attacks. And the third ones are time-driven attacks. And the difference between all these uh, categories is that, well, these are the capabilities that the attacker has. So in the first, yeah, in access during cache attacks, the, the attacker knows the cache lines that have been accessed by the victim. In trace during attacks, um, the attacker knows only a portion of the cache that has been accessed by the victim, but he doesn't know the specific line that the victim accessed. And in time during attacks, um, the attacker only knows the ex overall execution time of, of a secure process. So in order to illustrate you how cache attacks work, uh, I prepared two examples. I have the instructions here, but I guess it's better to see it graphically. So we have, let's say that we have the cache like this. We have these memory lines in the cache. And let's say that we evict this line. Evict means that um, we replace it with some other, some other memory line. And so this one is going to go to a level two cache, for example, or to the main memory. So if we do that, and then a victim uh, executes, executes his AES encryption, for example, and AES didn't use this cache line that we evicted from the cache, this execution time is clearly going to be shorter than if we do this. Let's say that we evict the first one, and AES needs it. Since we evicted the first memory line, and AES actually needs it, and instead of recovering it from the level one cache, it's going to recover it from the level two cache or main memory, um, this execution time is going to be short, and this execution time is going to be long. So these differences, um, well, thanks to this di difference on, on execution times, we know which cache line has been accessed by the secure process. So this is one example. Now I'm going to show you another example, which is Prime and Prof, which is the one uh, that Sang and the other authors used in the, in the paper I, I told you about before. So this time, we're going to fill the cache with, well, the attacker is going to fill the cache with his own data. Some cache lines, for example. So now, 
the attacker is gonna, well, the, sorry, the victim is gonna run the AES encryption and, the, and two things can happen here. Either the victim didn't access any of the cache lanes that, we, that, that the attacker has in the cache. So in this case, the attacker is gonna reload each, of one, each, each one of these, these memory lines that he has in the cache. And of course, since they reside in the level one cache, the, it's gonna be a short load time. So the, the time, well, the access time for, this, for each one of these memory lines is gonna be small. But what if the AS encryption needs one of the cache lines that um, the attacker is occupying? Well, <clears throat> looks something like this, right? It would look something like this. So one of the memory lines of the attacker has been evicted by, for, in the level one cache. So it went maybe to a, to a level two cache. So now when the attacker tries to reload, so he's gonna find out that this memory line takes short time because it's still in the level one cache. This memory line take, uh, takes a still uh, small time because or short time because it's still in the cache and this one as well. But this one, the one he had here, it's been kicked out to a level two cache, for example. And now he has to retrieve, retrieve it from there. So this means that it, it takes more longer time to, to, to access it. So in this way, the attacker knows which cache line has been uh, accessed by, by AES or by the victim. So this is how cache attacks work. And since we're going to attack AES, let's have a, a brief AES review. So um, AES is basically a symmetric block cipher that takes uh, 16 bytes of plain text and converts them to 16 bytes of cipher text and accepts keys of 16, 24, or 32 bytes uh, yeah, of size. So, and what's gonna change in, in the AES execution if we select 16, 24, or 32? Well, the AES is gonna run more number of rounds here. So this is how AES looks like. Um, we have four main, four main stages that are repeated. 9, 11, or 13 rounds, in, uh, depending on the key size that we selected. These four main stages are sub-bytes, sh shift rows, mixed columns, and add-round key. And actually, we see that in, in all of the cases, we have a last round in which, well, which looks pretty similar, but doesn't have the mixed columns operation. So I want you to notice this because then we're gonna use it as a fact on, in one of our attacks. But yeah. Um, what cryptographic library the developers, what they usually do is they merge these three stages into two stages, a table lookup operation and an XOR operation. And actually this is where the leakage comes from because what is a table lookup? It's simply a table to which we give an input and, and it gives the corresponding output, right? So the CPU to, to see which uh, output corresponds to the input we're inserting, let's say that we insert input one one, right? So now the CPU is gonna go to a memory to see what's the output corresponding to input 11. And therefore, since it's accessing uh, output 11, this is gonna be in the cache, right? And unlike the other ones, which are not being accessed. So these are the, the, the memory, yeah, memory lines that we're trying to figure out if the victim accessed or not. And why? Because the first round of AES with the T-table implementation looks like this. So we have, well, I, here I present only four bytes, and this should be 16 bytes. But anyway, for the scope of the presentation, it's, it's, it's okay, it's enough. So let's see that we have a key addition, um, a t-table lookup operation, and then this is the state for the next round. So if we know the t-table value that has been accessed, and we know the plain text that we are inserting, by a simple XOR, we can know the key. And this is why um, knowing the t-table value that has been accessed is, is that useful. Um, the first thing, ha the same thing happens with, with the last round, in which we have something like this, and if we know the cipher text that that, that, well, if we know the cipher text and we know the t-table value that has, that has been accessed, by a simple XOR, we can actually know the key that, that AES is using. And this is the fact that we are gonna use in, in to, rip, well, to, to implement our attacks. Well, since, well, now we, we know how AES looks like and we know how cache sidechain attacks uh, look like as well, so now let's talk about the attacks, the two attacks that we implemented in the cloud. One of them is Bernstein's attack. Um, it's a time-driven attack. Why? Because it only requires the execution time of a process. Um, it was first proposed by this guy, who's DJ Bernstein, in 2005. Um, it's one of the first cache uh, side channel attacks implementations. People have discussed it theoretically before him, but um, yeah, he came up with a practical implementation of these kind of attacks. And it's based on um, the fact that different memory lines have different access time, access values. For example. Um, this is how the accesses to the t-table that I, I was talking about look, look, look like. For example, we see that for different positions of the t-table, of the we have different access values, right? 
Um, and with this, with such patterns, we can actually infer what, the, what key has been used by correlation of traces. We'll see it later on. Um, but of course, the first, the first thing we need here is that both the attacker and, and victim have the same correspondence between access times and, and, and t-table values accessed. And this is uh, achieved thanks to, a, thanks to a library alignment process that Linux implements. So basically, Linux uh, aligns the shared libraries with page boundaries. So it doesn't matter if the victim's library start, starts here and the attacker's library starts here. Both of them are going to have the same correspondence between um, memory lines and, and access times. So now that we know this, let's see how Bernstein works. Well, we have three main, three main stages. One of them is the study phase in which the attacker uh, profiles his own cache architecture with a known key. Let's assume that we have an no, uh, old zero key, an old zero key. So the entry to the t-table is going to look something like this, right? In which, let's say that we have control over the plain text. So in this phase, we profile the cache architecture. In the second phase, we have an unknown key that then Let's assume again that we have control over the plain text, so, but we, ha we, don't have, we don't know the key that has been used, right? So clearly these two accesses are going to look similar, or the access times to, this, to these two accesses are going to look similar when both of them are equal, right? And if we know that both of them are equal, we can, if, and if we have control over the plain text, by a simple XOR, we can actually know the key that has been used. And this is how the output of a Bernstein attack looks like. In the first column, we can see that... Um, these are the number of, yeah. We, the first thing we see that it's, is that the key space has been reduced, so we don't get the, whole, the full key, but we, we reduce the key space. But this is important because as attackers, what we want to know is, or we want, what we want to do is just reduce the key space so that a, a, brute, a, a brute force attack is possible with the remaining key space. So the first column, first of all, um, yeah, it says how many possible key bytes each that the key byte being, being tested uh, has. For example, the key byte number zero has 48 possible values, and these are the values from most likely to less likely. So, um, thanks to the relationship or the, or the relation between t-tables and, 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 and plain text or ciphertext with the key, this attack can be implemented in the first round or in the last round, but we decided to implement it in the first round because it's, it's, a, it's a less noisy environment. And what we require to run it in the cloud is, first of all, a synchronized communication with an AES server, which, which is going to be the victim. We don't wanna, we, we're not going to know which key is the AES server using. We're just going to request encryptions. And then collocation with the server, so that both uh, attacker and victim are, are providing the same cache architecture. So for our test setup, we used the I5, an i5-3320. It has four cores, 2.6 gigahertz, and it has a level of level one cache size of 32 kilobytes. So it looks something like this. And yeah, notice that it has a shared level of cache because we're gonna use it later on in the next attack that we're gonna present. And yeah, our software environment is gonna, we're gonna use VMware ESXi 5.5 and XM 4.1 as our cloud providers. We're gonna, we're gonna use the AES implementation of OpenSSL 101, one of, one of the most recent ones. We're gonna assume that all VMs are using Ubuntu 12.04. And the, of course, the, since it's going to be a cross VM attack, a study and, and, and attack stages are going to be performed in different virtual machines. So we have something like this, in which the attacker has a virtual machine and performs a study stage, first of all, to profile his cache architecture. And then he's going <coughs> to attack another, well, another virtual machine that is collocated with him, that in this case is going to be a AES server running, a, well, encrypting with a, a known key, with a private key. So these are the results that we get. Um, yeah, the important one is, uh, well, let me point it. So it's this one and this one, because it's a cross VM scenario with uh, the latest version of OpenSSL. So we see that we reduce the keys. Well, they, yeah, the first thing we, we have to say is that the vertical axis um, refers to the number of key bits recovered, and the, the horizontal axis refers to the number of encryptions in it. So the first thing we have to notice is that, um, first of all, we don't recover the full key. This would, if we recover the, full, the whole key, we would be in 128 values here. But no, we only recover 40, 42, 43 bits of, of the key. And also, uh, notice that we need 2 to the 29 encryptions, which, it, which is quite high. <clears throat> and I want you to remember this, this, this data because, um, yeah, we're going to compare it later on with the next attack that we present. 
So we see that we reduce the key space in 42 bits more or less. But again, this is important because now the left, the key, the key space left is like 2 to, eight, 2 to the 80, which is close to the <clears throat> to the key space that can be broken by by brute force attack nowadays. Um, so yeah, let's present the next attack that we did. It's flash and reload. Um, it's a low noise cache attack, and we'll explain later why we call it low noise. Um, and it exploits basically uh, shared, yeah, memo shared memory pages and the duplication processes that are implemented in OSs and, and BMMs. So basically, um, they well, when two processes are using the same shared library, for example, instead of holding two copies in the memory, what these duplication processes are going to do is just um, store one copy in the physical memory. So that both processes are using the same, the same physical memory. And that's what we are going to explode with this attack. And yeah, so again, no redundant copies are stored when more than one um, processes are using the same shared library. Looks something like this, where we have, uh, let's say, two virtual machines using um, NUTLS as a shared library. And instead of holding two copies here in the, in the, in the server, in the physical storage, well, we're going to store only one of them so that both processes or both virtual machines are using the same physical memory. So where is this implemented? This is implemented in kernel same page merging, um, which, is, which appears in Linux, um, and in KVM as well, which is uh, basically a Linux-based, well, a Linux OS-based BMM. So what, basic, what, what they do basically is to take a Linux OS and they convert it into BMM so that it can, yeah, it can provide of virtual machines, virtualization, and so on. So that's why it appears in both of them. <coughs> It first appeared in kernel 2.6.32, and, and yeah, it does what, what it does is basically hash operations in the me, at the memory page level. So it takes um, those candidates, well, those pages that are candidates to be shared, and it performs hash, hash operations in them. And whenever it sees that um, two hash operations have the same output, um, it merges them, so that both processes are using again the same physical memory. But Linux is not the only one implementing this. Also, VMware is implementing this but with a different name, which is Transparent Page Sharing, TPS. But yeah, it's the procedure is basically the same. Hash operations at the page level, and then merging those pages that have the same hash output. Um, so now we're going to explain the steps of, of the flash and reload attack. And here, I'm going to stop by a little bit. So this time, we're going to work with memory lines rather than cache lines. And we're going to flash the desired memory lines. Flash doesn't mean a big, it's not the same. Flash means that we kick it out from all the cache hierarchy of all the cores present in the physical host that we are analyzing. Um, then we wait until the victim runs his process, and then um, we reload the memory lines that we're monitoring and measure the reload time. So we're going to see it better graphically. We have a share level of cache here and a memory line that we're monitoring, for example, the red one. And what we do is we flash it. Flash means put it in the main memory. So no longer present in any of the cache hierarchy, well, in the cache hierarchy of the physical host. So now the victim is going to run the AES encryption again. <clears throat> and two things can happen here. Either AES use the memory line that we're monitoring. So in that case, and since we have a shared level of cache, and we're working with, with shared libraries with the duplication processes, this is going to be present in the shared level of cache. And when we reload this, it's going to take short time. We're going to see it later on yeah, in a graphic. But if AES didn't use the memory line that we're monitoring, um, yeah, this still resides in the memory. And actually, the re this reload time it takes long time. So idea clear, right? A small reload time if line is in the cache, long reload time if memory line is in the memory. And it looks actually something like this. So this experiment was performed in an Intel Exeon 2670, which is uh, like the ones that Amazon has in his cloud, yeah, in his cloud system. And the reddish line refers to a memory line that is present in the access times to, the, to a memory line that is in the shared level of cache. And the blue line refers to a memory line, well, the access is to a memory line that resides in the main memory or in the RAM. So as we see, the difference here is quite big, right? The accesses to the cache uh, are like 70 cycles, and accesses to the main memory are like 200 cycles. So this is quite big. So if we put the threshold here, we can actually distinguish pretty well between cache accesses and main memory accesses. So that's why we call it low noise, because if we put the threshold here in the middle, sorry, here in the middle, we're going to have low misprediction rates. So nice, we have a super cool detector, yeah, detection method, but how do we apply this to AES? Well, again, we're going to, oh, sorry, 
we're going to monitor the t table values that have been accessed by AES. Um, so we're going to see an example here. Well, first of all, we have to say that um, we apply this to the last run because it doesn't have the mixed columns operations, and, uh, and it looks something like this. So it gives us a, a quite straightforward equation here. If we know this and we know the ciphertext, we can, by a simple XOR, know the key that has been used. <coughs> But in this, this time, we're going to work with some first positions of the table. It's going to look something like this. So let's again put the, the equation here and the, and the picture there. So this time, we're going to monitor one memory line. Let's assume that the memory line holds four, four t table values, t0, t1, t2, t3. So these are the values that we are monitoring if they have been accessed or not. What's going to happen? Since the key is fixed and constant here, um, this if these t-table values have been accessed, they are going to be mapped into four uh, different ciphertexts, right? C0, C1, C2, and C3. So each time these t-table values are accessed, they are going to map to one of those. But since this is a memory line, it's like loaded like this in the, in the cache, we don't know which, which ciphertext corresponds to which uh, t-table value. So how do we solve this? We're close to get the key, but how, would, how do we solve this? Well, um, we can actually XOR the each, each C0, well, each ciphertext value with um, each T table value. So basically, we're kind of um, seeing um, all the possible keys that can, ha could have been produced, could, could have been used. So for ex using C0, XOR T0, XOR T1, XOR T2, XOR T3, and the same with all the ciphertext. So we're going to get some, something like this, four sets in which we have a ra random values here, but the correct key is going to appear in all the sets. So that's how we're gonna how we're, how we're gonna decide what key has been used, and this attack can be translated into the cloud environment as well as the well as long as the the server has a shared level of cache. Um, yeah, the attacker and the victim, of course, are physically co-located and they are using the same hardware and therefore the same shared level of cache. And as long as the BMM uh, implements some memory duplication processes. Because yeah, in, in that way we can access the same physical memory. So for our scenario, for our test scenarios, we're gonna well we're gonna do three of them. The first one is gonna be that one in which we're gonna have oops sorry um, yeah a physical machine without virtualization, only one OS, and we're gonna run two processes. One of them is running AES, and the other one is running Flash and Reload to detect which accesses this AES process uh, is, is is doing. The second scenario. We're gonna have a, we're gonna move all this to the cloud, um, and we're gonna have a spy process in a in a virtual machine. So we have a single virtual machine here in the cloud, but within the same virtual machine, we're gonna run the two processes, and and one of them is again gonna take the accesses that AES is doing. And the third scenario, and the more challenging one, um, we're gonna do a cross VM attack in which we have two two virtual machines. One of them is running Flash and Reload, the other one is running AES, and of course uh, using the same hardware. So, again, our test setup, uh, VMware ESXi 5.5, Ubuntu 12.04 for the guest OSs. We're going to do, do this in an Intel i5 to zero again. Um, yeah, I told you before that to notice that the shared level of cache that, that this processor has or this uh, computer has. So we're going to use, yeah, this share level of cache as our cover channel. And again, we're going to work with OpenSSL implementation of AES. And of course, transparent page sharing is enabled and to perform these duplication processes. So these are the results that we get. Um, yeah, let me explain first of all. So the vertical line refers to the number of key bytes, uh, key bytes that we guessed correctly. So from 0 to 16, because we only have 16 bytes in the key. Um, and then the, the, the horizontal axis refers to the number of encryptions that we need. Um, yeah, the first thing to notice here compared to the previous attack is that we get the whole key. So for the three US scenarios, well, yeah, I didn't say this, but the blue, the blue line refers to the first scenario in which we have a spy process in a single OS. The green line refers to the second scenario in which we have a single VM. And the red line refers to the third scenario in, we, in which we have a cross VM attack. So we see that <clears throat> for all of them, we recover the whole key, unless the, unlike the other, in the other case. But also, uh, Another thing to notice here is that the number of encryptions that we need, for example, in the first case, is, it's 100,000 encryptions. In the second one, it's 200,000 encryptions. And in the third one, it's 400,000 encryptions. 
So clearly, these are like this number is much uh, lower than than the one we saw before that it was two to the twenty nine or two to the thirty. So this may seem, this this number this number of encryptions may seem a lot, but um, this all these measurements were taken under a minute. So this is yeah. Um, the, the blue line took like 12 seconds, this one took like 25, and this one takes like 55 seconds. So important thing here is that we recover an AES key thanks to side channel attacks in less than one minute. So by brute force attacks, uh, we shouldn't be able to recover an AES key with the computational resources that we have right, right now. But we're getting it yeah, in, in, in less than a minute, so that's how powerful side channel attacks can, can, can be. And actually, if we compare our attack with other attacks that in, the, in the area, so in the same, um, yeah, where's the mouse? I don't see it here. So in the same scenario, we have that we're, we are doing better than, than a big plus time, prime and proof, and some other collision timing attack. Well, <clears throat> this one is, is doing better than us because they're, they're assuming that AES, the ES execution can be blocked, and we are not assuming that because we think that it's not uh, too realistic. And in, cross, in terms of cross beam attacks, we can only compare it with, with our attack because we don't have any more. Um, yeah, we see the difference. Two to the three encryptions, 400,000 encryptions. And in, the, the, in, this, in this experiment, we didn't get the whole key. You only get the, got the reduced uh, key space. So we definitely improved a lot in, in, from one attack to the other. So now let's discuss some possible countermeasures that we can apply to this. Um, so first of all, uh, we're going to divide it into three categories. So in order to, be, uh, well, to avoid trace-driven cache attacks, what we can do is, in ca the case of AES, cache prefetching and cache flashing. It's pretty much, well, it's very similar, but it, some differences. So cache, cache prefetching, what means is that um, before the encryption or before each round of encryption, instead of um, accessing only one value, we're going to put all the TTable values in the cache. So now the attacker is gonna, is gonna see, well, when he checks if one T-table value has been accessed or not, he's gonna find out that all the T-table values have been accessed and he cannot distinguish between accessed or not accessed. Um, we have cache flashing as well, which is pretty much the same, but, well, yeah, in, in the opposite direction. Um, instead of putting all of them in the cache, the, the idea is to put all of them in the memory so that the attacker doesn't know again which, which T-table value has been accessed. We can increase the difficulty in time-driven attacks. How? Well, we saw that um, these attacks are based on different access values on, on the memory lines, right? So what we can do is, instead of accessing one single value, we can access all of them again. And now the time is going to be constant for, for each value that we access. Or also, <coughs> we can actually prevent alignment to page boundaries. In this case, in the second case, the, the, yeah, correspo yeah, the correspondence between um, Memory lines accessed and, and access times is not going to be the same for victim and an attacker. So the attacker cannot actually infer, or he's going to infer the wrong key. He's going to yeah, find out that the wrong key was used. And we can have hardware countermeasures as well, in which, for example, <coughs> we prevent the users to use the, the same portion of the cache. So we have the level three cache, for example. This is a shared level of cache. And we split it into pieces so that 10 and 1 is using one portion, 10 and 2 is using another portion, 10 and 3 is using a third portion and turn on for another one. So now since we don't have interferences here between um, these portions of the cache, uh, cache side channel attacks are, are pretty much impossible to do. Um, but what we could also do, it's uh, let's say that uh, BM1 sorry, accesses one, one memory line. So when the memory loads this memory line to the cache, um, we apply a, a private offset per VM. So now, Offset, well, BM1 has offset one or XORs with offset one, and when BM2 accesses the same memory line in the cache, even with the duplication, if another offset is applied to BM2, now um, are, they are going to be, or they are going to find out that in the cache, this data doesn't look this equal. And also, they are going to go to different cache lines, so the access times is going to be pretty different as well. <coughs> so, conclusions about the work we've done. Um, so there, is, there exists some hardware leakage across VMs that we have to get rid of. How? We, we have to perform isolation techniques uh, to avoid hardware leakage because this can be painful. And actually, we have two scenarios, right, um, of how side channel attacks can recover this, one of a, an AES key, for example. Um, <coughs> in the first scenario, we didn't have the duplication activated, so we could use Bernstein attack to get the reduced key space. 
And in the second scenario, we had the, the, duplication, the duplication process going on, so we could use flash and reload attack. So we, find, we found out that the duplication is a potential risk, right? Because we got an AES key in less than a minute. So we, we communicated this to VMware and, and they respond, well, they actually reproduced our attacks in, in, their, in, their, yeah, in their company or in their physical machines. And um, yeah, they released a document that we can actually take a look at um, explaining how, what's the configuration to avoid this, this kind of side channel attacks in the cloud. So you can take a look and see and yeah, and check what's out there. So I guess this is all. Thank you everybody and yeah, I'll answer 